Our speaker of this hour comes to us now from the Avondale Congregation in Atlanta, Georgia. But I especially remember him for an incident in class one day when the school was still at the Knight Arnold location. And we were talking about the fact that God had created the light from the darkness. And I made mention of something I know about physics that in a physics lab, it's impossible to make a perfect black body because there's always light present. And then I said, there's no such thing as a perfect black body. And our speaker went, And I've called him perfect ever since. <laughs> He's been preaching for 23 years since, his, since 1992. He graduated from this school in 94, got his Bachelor of Science degree from Ambridge University in 2001. His wife's name is Vanessa, and she won't cook a dinner for me. She's sitting out there and just looked at me with that look. <laughs> no, that's a long story, and that's not really true, but it just happened. They have three children and a brand-new grandchild sitting right back here. Is that Landon? That's Landon. That's Brittany's son. She is the wife of Willie Davis, and then they have Brianna and Bethany. He's done mission work to Guatemala on two occasions. I don't know if anyone else has ever done mission work in Guatemala. Do you, Bob? I, I think that's rare. He's written two books. One of them's called So You Want to Be Happy. The other is the teen edition of that very work. He's used all over the Brotherhood. He is very much in demand as a speaker. He also is a part-time teacher at the Georgia School of Preaching. He's been doing that for six years. He has the subject Marshall Keeble. Of all of the preachers of the 20th century, I don't know of anyone who baptized more folks or trained more preachers on an individual, individual basis than Brother Keeble did. But Brother Keeble owed his background to a man named George Bowser, who also knew, listen to this name, who also knew a, name, a man named Alexander Cleveland Campbell. And many of you are not familiar with Alexander Cleveland Campbell who around 1900 was the first restorer in the African-American community, or one of the first, and a great influence on Campbell, I mean, on uh, Keeble. Brother Keeble lived across the street from Brother Bowser, and they became good friends and did a lot of work together. But Brother Owens is going to talk to us about the struggles and the life of a great 20th century preacher, one of the greatest who ever walked on the face of the earth besides Paul and our Lord, Marshall Keeble. Brother Owens, perfect. Come and speak to us now. That's almost what I told him to say, but not, not, not quite. I am always honored to be a part of the Memphis School of Preaching Lectureship. Uh, the school continues to do a tremendous job equipping men to preach the gospel of our Lord. Countless souls have been brought to Christ through the work of this great school. The four seal Irene congregation, her leaders and members continue to be a tremendous blessing to the Lord's cause. And as one who was blessed to graduate from this school, it is my fervent prayer that she will long continue this soul saving work. There have been times when I have finished preaching. I'll be at the back like preachers do shaking hands. And someone will come out to the back door and they've said to me, that reminded me of Marshall Keeble. Now, I didn't always appreciate that compliment, but I do now. I also appreciate and am certain that such a comparison, kind though it may be, is truly unwarranted and wholly undeserved. 
I want to thank whoever gave me this assignment, for it made me read about the life of Marshall Keeble. And for that, I've been made better. My appreciation and admiration for Brother Keeble has grown exponentially. Brother Keeble's life was filled with great challenges and tremendous triumphs. The more one reads of his life, the more you are impressed by what you read. After reading several books, listening to multiple sermons, the Queen of Sheba's words ring true. The half has not been told. This afternoon, some of the things that we will cover will be the early days or the early life of Brother Keeble, his character, his preaching, some challenges, and some of the sayings that he was known for. Some of the language may be offensive to us today, but it was normal for Brother Keeble, and so it will be shared. And if it offends, then I apologize in advance. The restoration movement is largely associated with a few men who had started the plea to restore the patterns of New Testament Christianity. The names of Alexander Campbell, Barton W. Stone, Talbert Fanning, and David Lipscomb are generally associated with this movement in church history. Marshall Keeble is a vital personality in that evangelistic movement which began in the early part of the 19th century. The words, phrases, and sentences others have spoken about him paint for us an incredible portrait of his ability and influence. For instance, these words are found concerning him, written by J.C. Choate in his introduction of Roll Jordan Roll, where the Choate wrote, without doubt, Keeble is, best known, is the best known member of the Church of Christ. A paragraph later he wrote, quote, no other Negro preacher enjoys a national reputation of equal respect with that of Marshall Keeble, nor has any other preacher been so universally accepted by the members of his religious fellowship. Marshall Keeble was a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And before all of his fame and acclaim, he knew that the goal in life and in preaching was to exalt Jesus. And this he did. His preaching did the same, and like Paul, we should follow Brother Keeble as he followed the Christ. Concerning his humility, he was born December 7th, 1878. His father, Robert Keeble, was born into slavery. Marshall Keeble came from humble beginnings, but humble beginnings does not make you humble. The word humility, according to Thayer, is to make low or to bring to a low estate. And scripture enjoins this upon us all and that we are to do it to ourselves, James chapter 4 and verse 10. Marshall Keeble's origins didn't make him humble. He accomplished great things and he humbled himself. And this character trait is essential for all of us who will follow our Lord. And Jesus taught this was necessary in his first address to humanity. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Among the things that humility does is humility lowers one's self. But given the things he accomplished, Brother Keeble could have allowed his fame to go to his head. He could have held himself above others, but he did not. It is not until you read of his exploits that an appreciation for this challenge can truly be seen. He was featured in magazines and quoted in papers. Awards were given both by the church and to secular institutions. Some of them include in West Africa, he was made an honorary chief of a large Nigerian tribe. Harding University granted Brother Keeble an honorary degree of doctors of laws. Governor Frank G. Clement appointed him Colonel Aide de Camp on the governor's staff of honorary colonels. He is said to be responsible for baptizing between 30 to 50,000 people into Christ. He is considered by many to be the reason for the success of the restoration movement among African-American people. B.C. Goodpasture, a close friend of Brother Keeble's, captured the spirit of Marshall Keeble in these words, quote, perhaps the secret of his power and success is to be found in his humble and prayerful walk with God. He believes that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. In his preaching, one sees reflected the devotional spirit of the psalmist, the glowing fire of the prophets, the evangelistic fervor and zeal of the apostles, and the fearless courage of him who cleansed the temple. He impresses the listener as one who is mightily in earnest. He seems to feel that woe is unto him if he preaches not the gospel. His mission is to preach Christ and to save souls. His heart 
yearns for the salvation of his people. He is not made proud and boastful by his success and the complimentary things that the white brethren say to him, but rather made the more humble and the more grateful to an all-wise father for enabling him to be used for good. He realizes that if he should cease to be meek and humble, he would be bereft of his strength as Samson was when his hair was shorn. With him, the power is in the gospel, not in Keeble, end quote. Humility humbles itself, and Brother Keeble did that. Humility also accepts help. No man ever accomplishes anything alone, Brother Choate wrote. And it's been said repeatedly that if you see a turtle on a fence post, you know he didn't get there by himself. Moses was helped by Aaron, Joshua, and others. Paul was helped by Barnabas, Timothy, Silas, Phoebe, and others. Even our Lord accepted help. Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. The humble person knows he is not an island accomplishing great things. And Brother Keeble knew this as well. He identified, as Brother Mosier said, three gospel preachers as being largely responsible for his preaching the gospel. They are Alexander Cleveland Campbell, S.W. Womack, who became his father-in-law, and G.P. Bowser. Each an able preacher himself, and each contributed something to Marshall Keeble's approach and style. Of those men, Brother Choate wrote, Womack followed Alec Campbell out of the Christian church and joined hands with him in launching the restoration of the New Testament Christianity among the Negro people. In this respect, they may be compared to Alexander Campbell and Barton W. Stone. Each one of these men were instrumental in nurturing and growing the talent of Marshall Keeble. Marshall Keeble was also aided immensely by Brother A. M. Burton. Brother Burton funded much of Marshall Keeble's work, provided great sums of money to help him in any way that he needed. Other men who helped Brother Keeble included David Lipscomb, N.B. Hardeman, B.C. Goodpasture, and others. Luke Miller and John Varner were song leaders for Brother Keeble. The gospel advocate assisted Brother Keeble by receiving and reporting the results of his efforts. Words of encouragement were frequently heard from the gospel advocate concerning Marshall Keeble's work. One such report occurred in the advocate in 1918. In a four-year span, Marshall preached 1,161 sermons. Four years is 1,460 days. In 1,460 days, Brother Keeble preached 1,161 sermons. He baptized in that same span 457 people. He restored 86 and traveled 23,052 miles. There are other points about humility that are worthy of our consideration. Humility does not think less of oneself or bemoan one's inability. In the writings of Marshall Keeble, it is frequently said that Brother Keeble bowed to no man, but only to God. The humble person does not feign humility by lowering his head for others' approval. The humble person knows who he is and is not ashamed of his ability. Brother Keeble never put on airs to make people think he was something he wasn't. As one writer said, he was far too intelligent for that. Instead, in strength, he served the Christ, giving glory to God who enabled him. Marshall Keeble could not have accomplished all that he did in his life and in preaching without humility and without help. Concerning humility, Brother Keeble said, that is the lever that brings you up. Marshall Keeble was humble. Marshall Keeble had help. And Marshall Keeble was courageous. Courage is not foolishness in the face of difficulty. According to dictionary.com, the word courage is defined as the ability to do something that frightens one or strength in the face of pain or grief. That last part certainly reflects Brother Keeble. Strength in the face of pain or grief. He was not hot-headed or ill-tempered. Like our Lord, he remained calm under pressure. The Lord's dealing with the Pharisees and Sadducees demonstrate his calm assurance. The Lord's behavior at his trial manifests a strength and a courage and calm. And through the illegal arrest and trials, the false witnesses, the chanting crowd, Christ was never moved, 
moved to hasty or angry words. Brother Keeble must have learned this lesson from his Lord because he practiced it in his life. Many an author said of Brother Keeble, he was fast on his feet and often with kindness would disarm his enemies and make them his friends. A quote was attributed to Abraham Lincoln. It went something like this. Are men fit for the times or do the times make the man? In assessing the life of Brother Keeble, it, at least, it is at least my conclusion that Marshall Keeble was a man fit for the times. Born to former slaves, calling the times that he lived in difficult would be an understatement. The thought of racial equality was not simply a foreign concept to most people, but it was despised by many. It took so much more than talent to accomplish what Brother Keeble accomplished for the Lord. It took a Christ-like spirit, humility, meekness, courage, and a love for the Lord and his cause above one's self. He was born a little more than a decade after the Civil War. The country was dealing with the issue of slavery and the relationship between black people and white people. To simply quote the material from this time would offend some today. The words Negro and nigger were spoken frequently and with ease of speech. These words were often used to describe Marshall Keeble by friend and foe. These words were written, spoken, and was the common language of the day in and out of the church. Marshall was born into a time when racism was the norm. And through it all, he manifest a calm courage. He was threatened numerous times by the Ku Klux Klan. On one occasion, they busted into a meeting where he was preaching and they threatened everyone inside. And Brother Keeble kept on preaching. He said they were not trying to scare the black people. They were trying to scare the white people from coming to the meetings. Soon they were coming themselves to the meetings. And some of them even obeyed the gospel. On one occasion, those same individuals now without their hoods met Brother Keeble and they said to him, if anyone bothers you in this town, you let us know. And we'll take care of it. He was punched in the mouth with brass knuckles while preaching. It was in a tent meeting near the end of the service. Brother Keeble was extending the invitation and a young man came down to respond, or so he thought. Brother Keeble extended his hand and the man took it and then punched him in the mouth with the brass knuckles. Brother Keeble stumbled, recovered, and continued to extend the invitation. Many that were there that night wanted him to press charges. The police visited him that evening and asked him to swear out a warrant, but he declined. He was chased and harassed. He endured hard speech from within and without. He was threatened with tar and feathers. Reading his life reminds one of Paul's description of his life in 2 Corinthians 11, 22 to 33. He was frequently denied service and lodging. On one occasion, being very weary, traveling, he and a white brother stopped for lodging. They were attended to by a young attendant at the counter, told him that they were tired, wouldn't bother anyone, just needed to sleep. They would rise early and they would leave. The young man gave them a room and they were asleep. In the middle of the night, they were awakened with loud knocks on the door, an older gentleman opened the door and demanded that they leave. The brother asked why, that we would do no harm. We've already paid, we'll be fine, we'll be on our way. He tried to reason and plead. Brother Keeble, on the other hand, was getting dressed. He said, he does, you don't have to leave, but he does. To which the brother responded, if he has to go, I have to go. They left in the middle of the night together. On one occasion, on the way home from a meeting, Brother Keeble would often walk home from the meetings. In Florence, Alabama, he was met by some young men blocking the sidewalk. One boy drew a pistol and fired off some shots. Keeble said later he heard them, quote, whistling by his head. Keeble never missed so much as a half step. He pleasantly greeted them 
Good evening, gentlemen, and walked on. When questioned, well, let me back up and say this. Uh, shortly thereafter, the brethren having heard it, they offered him rides home. He declined. He continued to walk. He was asked about it, and he said he didn't believe the boys meant any harm. They just wanted to frighten him. It is difficult for those of us who are removed from the time to appreciate the times in which Marshall Keeble lived. A few reminders might be helpful. This was the time in our nation when black people were thought to be inferior to white people. Not simply inferior, but it was believed that black people were less than human. Some even argued that black people did not have souls, were under the curse of God, and the gospel of Jesus Christ was not even for them. That is what one man told Brother Keeble as they were setting up a tent for a meeting. He approached Marshall Keeble and he said, the gospel is for the nations. You Negroes don't even have a flag. You are not a nation. The gospel isn't even for you. Brother Keeble responded, well, no, but Brother Mark said, preach the gospel to every creature. Even you would have to admit we are creatures. <laughs> a man walked away in silence. Brother Marshall did not allow the world he was born into to make him a bitter man. And this alone is a great lesson for us today. It was not lived by everyone in Brother Keeble's day. He did not rail against the establishment, neither did he take the moral high ground and with righteous indignation, quote, get people told. He did not endorse racism. He worked to change it through the gospel. Marshall Keeble, it is said, never bowed to anyone but God. Fit for the times, indeed. He had the right spirit and ability for the times. He was graced with the rare gifts of pride in himself, a love for his people, humility of spirit, and a willingness to make use of what he had to win souls for Christ. He loved the Lord, and he sought to emulate him. He knew that the gospel was for all and that it alone had the power to change people. And so he preached the gospel of the great God of heaven. He shared the saving message of Jesus Christ with anyone who would receive it. And he did more to help break down the racial division in the church than any other person. It is without doubt that most men under the same circumstances would succumb to the bigotry, racism, and hatred he endured. But Brother Keeble did not. And we thank God for that. Brother Keeble was wise and discreet. It was a challenging set of circumstances in which he lived. The juxtaposition of relationship Marshall Keeble had among brethren demanded great wisdom and discretion. He was referred to as brother, while at the same time he was told that he and his people were not equal. It would have seemed confusing to have many white brethren help him, and many brethren oppose him. Some black brethren championed him and appreciated him while other black brethren berated him for being soft on race. The white brethren who helped were interested in saving the souls of black people and for this thanks should be had for without these efforts the gospel would have surely been hindered among black people in America. Of course as it is in every situation there were degrees of maturity among brethren. Some sought full integration and wanted black people to worship with white brethren no distinction to ever be made. Among these was David Lipscomb. Others believed white people and black people mixing together was to be avoided. They were not opposed to black people hearing the gospel from black preachers and white people hearing it from white preachers. Then there were also the view that black people should never see themselves as equals to whites. Some black brethren wanted Marshall to push harder and confront racism head on demand change. Some white brethren were happy that Marshall Keeble, quote, knew his place, kept it, and thought he should teach other black preachers to do the same. Marshall Keeble lived and preached, navigated through these rough waters with wisdom and discretion. These two competing thoughts were put into print, and they can be read in an editorial letter from Brother 4E Wallace Jr. entitled Negro Meetings for White People, and an article by Brother R.N. Hogan entitled, Enemies of Righteousness. We'll note and examine excerpts from both. In the editorial, Brother Wallace wrote, 
The manner in which brethren in some quarters are going for the Negro meetings leads one to wonder whether they are trying to make white folks out of the Negroes or Negroes out of the white folks. The trend of the general mixing up seems to be toward the latter. Reliable reports have come to me of white women, members of the church, becoming so enamored over a certain colored preacher as to go up to him after a sermon and shake his hands with him holding his hands in both of theirs. That kind of thing will turn the head of most white preachers and sometimes affect their conduct. And anybody ought to know that it will make fools out of the Negroes. For any woman in the church to so far forget her dignity and lower herself so, just because a Negro has learned enough about the gospel to preach it to his race is pitiable indeed. He continued, reliable brethren in the valley have reported the definite inclinations of the Negro man and his wife in charge of the orphan home for colored children at Combs towards social equality. They are supposed to be members of the church, and some of the white brethren are apparently encouraging them. It is said that these two Negroes have privately stated that they favor social equality and are working for it. Still later, in one of my own meetings, a young Negro preacher was engaged by the church as a janitor. He made it a point to stand out in the vestibule of the church building to shake hands with the white people. When I insisted that it be discontinued, some of the white brethren were offended. Such as this proves that the white brethren are ruining the Negroes and defeating the very work that they should be sent to do. That is, preach the gospel to the Negroes to their own people. This editorial letter from the scholarly mind of 4E Wallace Jr., though hard to believe today, accurately portrays the general sentiment of white brethren of the day. In the same letter, Brother Wallace also mentioned Marshall Keeble. Of Brother Keeble, he said this, I have always said that Marshall Keeble and Luke Miller could not be spoiled. But if I ever hear of them doing anything akin to such as this, Earlier in the piece, he referenced a young white preacher generally mixing and sleeping in the same bed as a black preacher, R.N. Hogan. It is that this that he referenced, if I ever hear anything akin to this, I will take back every good thing I have ever said of them. Keeble should teach these Negro preachers better than that, even if we cannot teach some young upstart among the white preachers. Their practices will degrade the Negroes themselves. It is abominable. R.N. Hogan, a black preacher who was referenced by name in Brother Wallace's letter, wrote an article entitled Enemies of Righteousness. He began his article with a quote of Acts 13 and verse 10, where Paul rebuked Elymas and referred to him as being full of all subtlety, all mischief, a child of the devil, and an enemy of righteousness one who perverts the right ways of the Lord. From that starting point, Brother Hogan wrote this. Now, if this man was full of all subtlety, all mischief, a child of the devil, an enemy of all righteousness because he sought to turn this man from the right ways of the Lord, aren't all people the same who are turning others from the right way of the Lord today? If not, why not? He continued. I wonder if my so-called, quote, white brethren think that they are upholding the right ways of the Lord by barring Christian Negroes from being taught the word of God in their churches and so-called Christian schools. Is this practice the right ways of the Lord? If not, aren't they guilty of perverting the right ways of the Lord? And if they are perverting the right ways of the Lord, aren't they also full of all subtlety, all mischief, children of the devil, and enemies of all righteousness, just as was the sorcerer of our text? who was reprimanded by the Apostle Paul. Later in his article, he discussed the decision of Christian college presidents to refuse to allow black admittance into their schools. He wrote, please hear me. Just as sure as God rejected King Saul, these men are rejected, if they have ever been accepted. Did these schools or did these men discuss and agree to refuse admittance into their schools? The Filipinos, Japanese, Chinese, Frenchmen, Englishmen, Italians, Germans, Russians, Koreans, Mexicans, Indians, and etc.? No, absolutely no. Only the Negro. They hate only the Negro. Do you mean to tell me these men love God and hate the Negro? Anyone who would take such a stand should read 1 John 4, 19 and 20. Chapter 3 and verse 15. 
Marshall Keeble walked among these two positions and with wisdom and discretion helped save souls. His wisdom is seen in, his, in first in his response to Brother Wallace. He wrote a letter. Here it is in its entirety. Dear sir and brother in Christ, for over 30 years I have tried to conduct my work just as your article in the Bible banner of March suggested. Taking advice from such friends as you have been for years has been a blessing to my work. So I take the privilege to thank you for that instructive and encouraging article. I hope I can conduct myself in my last days so that you and none of my friends will have to take back nothing they have said complimentary about my work or regret it. Please continue to encourage me in my work and pray for me. Fraternally yours, M. Keeble. Given the same circumstances, most would have failed to have this level-headed, Christ-like approach to such a letter, especially if one has given his life to preaching the gospel of Christ in a gentle, dignified manner under such trying circumstances. But as Jesus stood in the face of opposition and continued doing good, so Marshall Keeble walked in the steps of the Savior. His answer to Brother Wallace helped everyone involved and served to help the cause of Christ and hinder nothing. He was equally wise and helpful in his approach to Arian Hogan. Keeble counseled Hogan not to press the segregation issue as he was pressing it, much to Hogan's disapproval. Keeble viewed Hogan as fighting his friends, and his attitude would create division among black people in the church, and eventually it did. Just as a younger generation grew weary with Martin Luther King Jr.'s progress and sought a more radical approach to change, there was a younger generation of blacks in the Church of Christ growing weary with Marshall Keeble's leadership. Marshall Keeble was centered between these two positions, but he did not allow selfishness, ego, or pride to hurt the cause of Christ. Like Paul, he became all things to all men. He emptied himself and allowed Christ to fill his soul. His answers were soft, and they turned away wrath. He set a wonderful example of how to handle adversity with dignity and Christian grace. He answered not men according to their folly. Instead, he exercised wisdom, humility, and discretion when he answered. Brethren on both sides would have benefited greatly by following Marshall Keeble's example. Sadly, the issue of race continues to plague the Lord's church even today. Though much good has been done, we can all strive to fulfill our Lord's desire. May our love for one another demonstrate to the world that we are his disciples. Let us all commit to honor all men, to love the brotherhood, to fear God and honor the king. May we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. We know well that our Lord purchased only one church and therefore we should all love the brotherhood. How sad that even today we suffer with two. It's common for brethren to speak of black and white brotherhoods and black and white churches. How sad must this, must this be for the perfect Lamb of God to watch from heaven as his children refuse to love one another per the example he provided. How sad for those who have suffered to refuse to consider that Christ also suffered and he did not threaten. How sad for those who have advantage to make distinction and to splinter the glorious bride of Christ to be accepted and approved of by the world. We should all remember the world also rejected Jesus. There are many additional points about Marshall Keeble. He came from a home of hardworking people, were dignified, desirous to learn all they could. Marshall worked hard all of his life before and during preaching. He held jobs in a bucket factory and a soap factory. He even went into business for himself, owning a grocery store. He worked hard to support his family. He was always neatly dressed and carried himself as a fine Christian gentleman. He was heavily influenced by Booker T. Washington, the great orator for education and the uplifting of black people. Marshall often heard him speak and learned much from these experiences. He was keenly interested in education. The education of his people was part of the several efforts to have schools for black people. 
One school was an effort called Silver Point. This work was done with A.M. Burton. Another effort was the Southern Practical Institute. Sadly, both efforts eventually failed. He did great work as president of the Nashville Christian Institute. It was even encouraging the beginnings of the work of the Southwestern, Christian, uh, Southwestern College in Terrell, Texas. Brother Keeble wrote a book regarding his missionary journey to the Holy Lands. He preached in numerous places on that journey, was always warmly received. He trained many a young man to learn God's word, and some even traveled with him and preached before him. These young men became affectionately known as Keeble's boys. The first stop he made to the Holy Lands was in London, and when attending service there, he was thrilled to find out that the individual doing the preaching was one of those boys. He traveled to London, to Paris, to Rome, to Cairo, Egypt, on his way to Jerusalem. The trip to Jerusalem was among the most moving experiences in all of Marshall Keeble's life. In his own words, he said this, We left the spot where Jesus was tried, spat upon and crowned with thorns, and we took the path which led to Calvary. The priests were making their regular Friday march along this path, the path which Jesus took to his crucifixion carrying his own cross. This is called the Via Dolorosa, or Way of Sorrow. Walking slowly in a sad procession, we thought of the many sufferings which our Lord endured before he was finally nailed to the cross and lifted up. I don't think I would have been able to bear to relive these things in my heart if I had not remembered Jesus' own words. And if I be lifted up upon the, from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. There is power in the old gospel. Some sayings and thoughts about Marshall Keeble. He was a preacher. He loved preaching. It's the only thing he wanted to do. He did it best and he loved it. Some of his sayings, the Bible is right, he would say. You can leave this meeting and go home mad, but the Bible is still right. You can fuss at Keeble all night, but the Bible is right. You can walk the streets, call Keeble a fool, but the Bible is right. You can go home and have spasms, but the Bible is right. <laughs> if we all die and go to hell, the Bible is still right. He would say, I would rather stand four square on the word of God than anywhere else. I would rather stand on God's word than heaven and earth because the Lord said heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will last forever. He loved to preach. In preaching, he loved to have tents and he loved to use the intercom. According to Keeble, the public address system would let him speak to those who would not come under the tent, who felt they could, quote, hide in the dark or sit on the front porch or maybe even go inside and shut the door. He said, let them shut the doors, I'll shoot it through the keyhole. <laughs> Brethren, there is so much more information here on Marshall Keeble. It was a blessing. And again, I want to thank personally the individual who gave me this assignment. You're welcome. It was perfect. <laughs> Brother Keeble loved to laugh. He laughed at himself and he laughed with others. He enjoyed sports. On one occasion he was asked how he moved so well, even in his 80s. He said, I run with young folks. That's how I do it. If I hung around you old folks, I'd have arthritis, neuritis, and bursitis, and all of the itis pains. <laughs> well, I couldn't even get around, he says. As it is, I can go around the world, and he did. At 83, he went around the world preaching the gospel. Marshall Keeble believed in the Lord and his cause, and he preached it, and he lived it. He lifted up Jesus and he drew all men to him. The world is a better place and heaven is more populated because Marshall Keeble lived. And may God bless every one of us in this room to have the same said of us, that the world is better and heaven more populated because we live. God bless you.